hand into the theater and the usher nods me in. They know me here. I descend down the staircase behind the movie screen that only select people know about. The door at the bottom opens and I walk in. The sound of movie spoilers fill the air. The barkeep has my drink ready and motions me to the back. The rest of the crew are here already. This is my type of place and these are my type of people. Join me as we discuss the inner secrets of cinema. Have a seat in the spoiler room. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Spoiler Room. Uh, another one of those impromptu ones where I saw the film and had to talk about it, and I managed to find two people to talk about it with. And tonight in the Spoiler Room to talk about Hereditary. Hey, ha, ha. Is, uh, <laughs> That's that's what I got it right. Uh we got a great crew tonight. First off, we have Mr. Astro Radio Z himself. He's been on hiatus for a while from podcasting and such and from the spoiler room. Glad to have him back. Hello, Derek. How are you? I am wonderful, Mr. Mark the Movie Man. Thank you for bringing me out of my cave to talk about heredity. Wait. <laughs> There we go. Uh, here we go. Sorry, going to be a long episode. And next to Mr. Derek <laughs> Carey is the lovely Mr. Andrew Shearer. Hello, Andrew. How are you? I'm good, man. And hey, this is special. We got the band back together. We got the band <laughs> back together. Yeah, so, yeah, her- hereditary. Here to talk about. <laughs> hereditary. Her hereditary, Harry Dirty. Let's do it. Her edit, Terry. What? Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a word. Okay, like uh, bullshit reality. Who uh, let Ted Levine into this motherfucker? Oh no. I'm sorry, I didn't hand it. Correct you. I can't stand knitting you. Now you know. Oh shit! Oh, what Mumble if I... jumble. I got myself into. Uh, <laughs> well, Mr. Levine, did you want to give us the synopsis of uh, Hereditary? No. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, how about how about I quit fucking around? Ah, you you for real want me to do it? In the basket. Hereditary <laughs> takes the it takes the child and puts it in the head in the basket. <laughs> So, it puts ants on the head in the basket. <laughs> so, all right. So, Hereditary is a uh, is about uh, this woman named Annie, and her mother dies, and that sets off like the basically their whole family going to hell. The end. Yeah, that's that's a good summary of it. Uh, nice, quick, and to the point. That that's pretty much what goes on in here. Uh, Brought to us by a gentleman who this is his first feature, Mr. Ari Aster. And uh, yeah, uh, Andrew, we'll, we'll start with you. Uh, what stood out with you when you first, when the film first started? What was there anything in particular that stood out for you right away? Like, oh man, this is a type of movie we're into. Uh, was there any let on to what was coming? Um, I was happy that it wasn't a lot of action, you mm-hmm. know? that it that it that it was slow moving because uh, my concern was that you know with the trailers uh e24 who has been doing what is called i guess we would call art house horror making a lot of people angry with their movies um i was like oh man are they like going conjuring now are like they really gonna is this gonna be a, a action blast like that you know you know just as a bit to go no guys really we make real horror come on so the fact that things weren't like jumping and loud noising, and you know what I'm saying? You, you mean a, a one, two, three jump? One, two, three jump. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, I, I was, I was, yeah, I, I dug that a lot. I mean, I don't really want to go to see horror movies anymore, Derek and Mark. I don't. Really? <laughs> I don't want to go see <laughs> I'm, them. I'm starting the to reason, get there with you, Andrew. I the, really. The main am. reason I saw the last three horrors that came out was because I knew everyone of my friends were going to want to talk to me about them. <laughs> and, you know, like, I didn't go see it. And everybody's like, why don't you go so we can talk about it? <laughs> What's wrong with it? And I'm going like, I'm just done. 
<laughs> I, I I wasn't crying when I asked. No, just uh, nah, man, for real. <laughs> so if you want to know what I was thinking, mostly it was like, um, all right, I'm here. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the theater. I might as well watch this. No, it was a free. It was critic screening. You know, I'm by myself, yeah. and oh, the, the employees are there. So you know, True. it's like a good setting to see horror. I don't have to sit there and listen to the people next to me going like, when's something going to happen? Yeah, that's or true. laughing at everything that happens. I, ugh. yeah, I, I forgot oh, they're what... laughing at the movie. No, they're laughing at Twitter because they're not watching it. Yeah, exactly. I forgot which movie it was. It wasn't a uh, break in, but it was one of the recent like thrillers or whatnot. I was watching it and there was this one guy there and he was just having a blast. <laughs> he was like, he's like, Oh shit, don't go in there. Don't go in. I'm like, <laughs> we're, we're exchanging commentary back and forth. There's like five of us in the theater, but um, yeah, for this film, definitely you don't want giggly teenagers though, even though it, it you know, it is rated R, so you won't get as many giggly teenagers. Uh, but at the same time, that audience, I don't think, will really enjoy this film. Hey, Derek, that'll be a good transition to you. Uh, <laughs> well, why are you setting me up like that, Mark? Throw me right under the fucking bus. I why did you paint you? that picture, Mark? I didn't throw anybody under what? No, no, no. I'm sure. You've I'm gotten a lot more cynical and dark. Since we've last tar- talked, I, I, maybe a little. It's, Dark it's a little the movie man. Yeah. Dark the movie man. Dark the movie man. Nice. Turn of Durant. <laughs> <laughs> Dark Mark. <laughs> oh God. But Derek, when you watched it, uh, I kind of know your feelings. Like, but was there anything that stood out to you to this film? You know, when when you started watching it and whatnot, you know, uh, that maybe appealed to you at least a bit uh i i think you're painting me as as someone right off the bat that that doesn't like this movie mark um right off the bat this movie how do i put this it has an amazing craft to it Mm -hmm. The, the cinematography is gorgeous um with the lighting just being very meticulous and natural um, the art design, because our principal character, she makes, she's an artist who makes uh, models, like miniature models, and the movie pulls in. It starts off the first shot, pulls in. It's a master shot inside of a room that pulls into another room and then seamlessly goes into the first scene. And uh, from the onset, it's a it's a model house. And this is this play on images is something that happens throughout the entire movie. And there was a lot of that in this that was really striking and very well thought out and beautiful to look at. And like Andrew said, it is it is methodically paced and paced in a way that makes your mind wander and kind of think about what it's processing and what it's seeing. Um, And that kind of thing I love. Mm-hmm. I love to death and uh, for the probably like the first hour of this movie, I was really captivated by just the overall craft of it and the tone that they were going for. It's not very often that you get to go to the movies nowadays and see movies that take their time. Right. Because the vast majority of everything we see now, and I'm just going to use this as a reference because I just kind of gave up on it uh, after two episodes is, um, on Amazon, they just start. They just released um, a remake, quote unquote remake, in uh, miniseries form of Picnic at Hanging Rock. Yeah, I saw. Yeah, I saw the advertisements. For yep. That. If you're familiar with the original source material with the original film, um, that's also another very subtle, slow tone piece, mm-hmm. and the. The TV series, not to go on a wild tangent, but no, I'm going to no, do okay. so anyways. Um, it's been a while since I podcasted, Mark. I got to work know. some things out. I'm a little. It's all good. Out. It's all good. Dude. <laughs> so no, but the but the TV show starts that way, but then starts glitching out in weird, uncomfortable ways. And I'm by uncomfortable, I don't mean like it's scaring me or disturbing, but in ways that pull you out of it 
that the original didn't, and it's trying to replicate the original. So it's like this weird juxtaposition between the old 70s style and the now modern style, which in TV language is probably like American Horror Story or Penny Dreadful or whatever it is. Right. Um, And Hereditary didn't feel for that first hour like it was adhering to any modern sensibility. Mm -hmm. And that's what really struck out to me. Yeah, and I, I I joke. I was just giving you a hard time. I know you didn't completely hate the film. I apologize for painting you into a corner there. Yeah, uh, thanks, but, thanks for letting me build up an opinion here, Mark. You're welcome. I, I, I let you grow. <laughs> no, I agree with you guys completely with the cinematography. That's what really caught me. And I thought doing that master shot where it pulls into the dollhouse sets it up because and you guys are are the master filmmakers. Uh, mad respect for your guys' talent. So tell me if I'm wrong or whatnot, but were some of the shots set up specifically to make you feel like you were still looking through the miniature dollhouse? I think so. Did, did, did you feel that way at all, Andrew? I don't know if I thought about it that much, but that's oh. a pretty cool idea. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> it just, for me, there were some of the shots where it was giving a lot of headroom and and the scene the the people were smaller than what you're kind of normal used to seeing like some of the shots in the hallway and some of the shots in the room for me i i kind of came off to me as almost like they were scenes in her one of her miniatures because you keep coming back to the miniatures and uh tony collette uh who plays annie I uh, just, I love her. Um, uh, and she, she just goes all in on this, but her character, every time we see her in her art room, she's making a different miniature. I'm like, how many miniatures is she making? Holy crap. Um, uh, but I think that was to add to her, uh, mentality, uh, you know, on this. And I, I really enjoyed what they did with her character. And it was a bit unexpected because, I kind of thought they were just going to play off the angle of her being skit, just being crazy uh, from a crazy family, you know, as the name implies and, and not taking such a jump at the end there with uh, the uh, spirits and how it got supernatural. But uh, Andrew, did you feel that way in the beginning? Maybe they were leaning towards you questioning whether or not she was just crazy. Uh, well, you know, you start off a movie that artfully and have so many things in there and, uh, you know, there are obvious clues and things like that or, you know, pieces of a puzzle. Um, you can't really, you have to, you have to kind of like assume that every single thing they do is deliberate, you yeah. know? And so I don't really like stuff like that <laughs> <laughs> because I like to just, you know, I, I don't like things to be like super kind of complicated like that. Mm -hmm. Um, don't look now is probably the biggest influence on this movie um, because that's also a movie about um, the, the death of a, of a child and its impact on a family and then the cult thing and all of that. So it'd be surprising to me if this guy wasn't a big fan of that, but he's also a first time director. And right. he's doing like a real kind of kitchen sink thing with this movie. <laughs> Big time. Yeah. And so you're like, all right, man, you got to applaud that effort. But um, so you can just watch it one time. I mean, you, you could, I guess, if you're like just that dismissive. But this movie wants you to watch it again, which I can't say for most entertainment these days. Most of them just want to make their mark and hopefully get a sequel so they can then do all of that stuff. But this movie puts everything out there so that you get you get all of it. You know, it was almost like he never thought he's going to get to make another movie. <laughs> Would you agree with that, Derek, that he kind of threw everything that he ever wanted to do in a film in this one? Yeah. I, that's kind of ultimately what made me a little dissatisfied with the film. Uh -huh. Cause I think the film works um, at its best when it is kind of a meditation on loss. When it's uh, when it's this family who has just gone through the loss of uh, the matriarch, the the grandma, yeah, and then uh, suddenly they go through the loss of their daughter. Just it, of any movie that I've seen of late, the scene in which she dies, the daughter dies, came out of nowhere for me. Yeah, right, and 
like I literally had my my mouth wide open. Like I felt like somebody had just punched me in the chest. And there it's not very often that that happens. And um I unfortunately think and I know this has been discussed um in other places that um the marketing of this film did a real disservice to it. I yeah. really I really do and I understand why they had to do it cuz it's really hard to get people to go see horror movies especially in the middle of summer um especially ones that don't have pre-existing properties attached to them cough it um it's really tough to market these kinds of movies especially something as slow burn as heredity is um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> but, but i i I do feel the marketing of this film being the quote unquote scariest film you'll ever see (sighs) ultimately made me through as it, as the movie goes along. Cause I think that scene where the daughter dies is just so impactful and so shocking and so devastating that it never quite hits that mark again. Mm-hmm. And I think it wants to because then after that point, it becomes a really hard drama for a long time. And I think that's where this film works best. Now, because it's the spoiler room, we can get into this this shit. Yeah, I think that final act where all of a sudden it becomes about a cult and we're dealing with naked ghosts hanging out in corners and a bunch of backstabbery witchery do that section didn't work for me Mm -hmm. and it it ultimately left me really disappointed because I thought that, you know, this was going to be one thing and then they pull the switch redo nonsense. So this kitchen sink attitude that, you know, this idea we had talked about where it's a guy just like throwing all his ideas. And uh, obviously as a first time director, I'm sure he's wearing his influences on his sleeve where, where a really, interesting film was then turned into kind of like a baby horror film with an edge yeah so yeah, i can see that i, I that, that's where it's just like ah oh, man you almost had it you almost stuck the landing you almost had it and it just ah oh, man I, I was really sad by that but yeah that scene with the daughter holy fuck that is one of the hardest scenes i've seen in a movie in a long time and what well, what helps with it is uh, the Peter character, Alex Wolf, who's the driver of that. He he sells the shit out of that scene. It's just like you're right there with him. Like, oh man, isn't it devastating to see the impact it has on him, and subsequently the emotions and the feelings he's going through that nobody's recognizing but the dad. Yeah. That to me felt so real so unbelievably real in a world in which men are reduced to beings that don't have feelings and should just be able to move on from things. There were consequences to those actions and it reverberated around inside of him in such a profound way that that the rest of the movie, he was a completely different character. He, He was, and it was, it was heartbreaking. I, I was like, Wow, we're staying on him for a long time. You just see him trying to 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 comprehend, and then he does that one extra movement that just crushed me. Was he almost looks into the rearview mirror, but doesn't? But he looks just enough to realize, you know, it's just like fuck. He he, he did that so well, Andrew. What'd you think about this whole scene? Did you did it really feel a uh, kind of gut punch for you? Oh, it was very impactful the way it was shot. You know, like uh, I kind of like. I, I connected to it a little personally, weirdly enough. Um, uh, first, because I have a peanut allergy, for one thing. Well, there you go. So as soon as they establish that, I'm going like, oh my god, I don't know if I, you know. I you know yeah, they telegraph yeah. a lot of things. Again, first time director here, kitchen sink. But like, um, when that decapitation happened, right as it was happening, I was thinking, does this guy know about this real accident that happened in Georgia a few years ago? Like, did mm-hmm. that, like, did he happen to see that headline? Do you guys want a sidebar and know what happened? Yes. Yeah. yeah. There was two friends out drinking and they drove, they were driving home on the expressway 
and uh, her, his buddy leans out the passenger side window to vomit, and he catches a support wire for for you know a, a, a pole or something like that, and it cut his oh. shit right off. So wow. the other guy's so drunk, manages to make it home. Just parks the car, gets out, goes to bed. Next morning, comes out to check out where his buddy is, and there's most of them in the car. Oh, oh my fuck. god! Like that really happened. So I, I saw oh. as soon as I saw that, I was like, "Shit, dude! I wonder if you know what I mean." So you got two things happening pretty much consecutively that I identify with, and you know their own respective ways. And so, to me, that yeah, it was very smart. But in terms of um, the character Peter, he's pretty much the ash of this movie. Like when the act three that Derek is talking about, when everything just becomes, you know, I would never say it becomes action horror, but it definitely is like evil dead to meets Lords of Salem. You know, yeah. you have this very put upon leading guy that you're like, dude, how many times are they going to like, you know, how much abuse is he going to take? It gets a little comical. Um, and then of course the ending with the cult room that is, was spoiled on the cover of room Morgue magazine. <laughs> when you're desperate for marketing yeah uh what you know that's the fangoria tradition though of right. spoiling all this stuff in the magazine so um but yeah i i uh i definitely i i just felt like that particular set piece you know as long as he can come away with some things uh in his movie that you're like dude his next movie's gonna be you know what i'm saying yeah um, like that guy that made Krisha and then made it comes at night. I still think Krisha is a better movie, but that's the curse of the debut. That's awesome. There's nowhere to go, right? You know, very seldom. So. In all, in all honesty, it, it, pardon my invoking his name, but it's kind of the M Night syndrome to where M Night made his premiere with Sixth Sense, which had a twist which caught many people. Some it didn't, but caught many many of your mainstream audience. So then it was almost like every movie, it, it felt like he had to put a twist in because that's oh, yeah. what people expected. Well, oh, it's also wonder- that idea of like the the first album where you have your whole life to write this one thing. And then if that hits, then you got to produce something just as good almost immediately. Mm. You know, so, so in- instead he's got like this you know, mixture of great things and just kind of by the numbers things uh, as kind of experimenting with it. So he doesn't have that curse of the sophomore amazing movie. If he's cursed by anything, it's the marketing. Um, But, you know, we got to all remember no matter how many movies they say is like the exorcist. We don't live in times where we can be scared the way we were scared of the exorcist because people believe that the exorcist, the movie itself is evil. And no yeah. one will ever think that about a movie ever again, except well, Serbian film. Well, we're much more a secular society now. Yeah. It isn't like when The Exorcist came out. I mean, there are still a lot of people out there that are believers. And some of the stuff in Heredity um, is going to affect <laughs> them. Um, but for the for the most part, we're kind of like a post-God society. A lot of, well, not a lot of us. We're still a s- small percentage, but... There's a, a growing uh, amount of dissatisfaction with faith in the in this country. So d- ways to scare the audience are getting varied and strange now. And that's uh, it, and it shows kind of in hereditary. I, I said it right that time. Mark, <laughs> just to let you know. Um, because it is kind of all over the place. And that, that, that final act is kind of a kitchen sink kind of thing. And I agree with Andrew where it's just like, some of the stuff that was shown, you know, like Rue Morgan, like you had referenced, or I'm looking at imdb.com right now, and it has a tremendously huge spoiler staring me right in the face. Yeah, the thumbnail for the trailer. I saw that. And it's just like, well, obviously we're on the spoiler room, so we can see it. That And it's in the, I mean, it's a striking image. Obviously, you would use it in the trailer, but I mean you realize someone's going to get immolated. So the entire scene where, you know, her and uh, Gabriel Byrne are arguing back and forth, he is convinced that she's completely bonkers and she needs to, he needs to take her to a doctor and institutionalize her. And she's like, dude, we need to burn this fucking book 
Shit's going to go down. I will totally die for this, so the rest of you guys will be fine. And we know she's not the one that's going to die because it's yeah. in the trailer. Yeah. But, you know, also, not to defend it, because you know how I feel about trailers and all this stuff. And it, I agree. It was some of the tension went out for me because of scenes like that that were in the trailers and the marketing. However, for younger people, the the box, the, the pocketbooks that every movie company wants, um, knowing that the, there's going to be a person catch on fire could create anxiety instead of the opposite. And in a person who's skittish or scared might go like, I know this person's going to catch on fire and it's, you know, to make them anxious, you know, that could be, that, that, that could be the only way I could rationalize. (laughs) I mean, not to make this completely about trailers and marketing nowadays, but, but it's the same thing. Like I know we were talking about it earlier on Facebook today when the Halloween trailer came out, how now all trailers have to have like a five second, you know, stinger reel or splash reel before the actual trailer. Yeah, I noticed that the Spider-Man had that too, the Spider-Verse or whatever. Every trailer has it now, Mark. Seriously, go through That's your it. Facebook feed and any trailer that pops up that is new will have that and it ruins it. and like Andrew said on Facebook, it's because the the attention span nowadays is so small that when you're flipping through on your phone, they need to catch you. Like they have to like Zone in on whatever it is that you find appealing, which is obviously sensationalized images, so quickly to make you actually sit and watch that. Well, but to us old the, school uh... people, it's just like, man, I want a trailer to build and grab me because of its story and its content, not because all of a sudden I saw, you know, I saw a wolf cop shoot a guy through a face. I mean. <laughs> Yeah, no, they're they're just they realize that the average engagement of anybody on social media with any given page or story, they're not even going to click on the trailer to go to an external site. You need to give them as whatever you got to you get you get a moment is what you get with people. Well, you know, and for the type of film that. Sorry, I'm doing laundry. Oh, that's laundry. I thought you were getting that vibrator a little early. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, well, I mean, Jack my Rabbit. butt, my butt plug does go pretty loud. I was gonna say, dude, leave it until the end of the episode at least. <laughs> you know what I like to do is pl- it put put the old bug zapper in there in the summertime. <laughs> and get in. Wow, because you're 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 getting pleasure and you know you're, you're ridding yourself service. of pests. Yeah, yeah, you're doing a service. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Uh, but to bring it's it's kind of, to bring through the rest kind of the episode i should just also just arbitrarily go oh god <laughs> what have i done <laughs> but i get uh, one of the juicy ones you know to bring it back around to hereditary um the trailers though you're, you're right on that in, in that uh they gotta catch you but for a film like this it's it is slow in its pace compared to a lot of your other more modern f- horror films. So they, I guess, had to put it together. They felt because they're trying to pull the audience in because they're afraid people aren't going to see a slower burning film and no pun intended, but you know, literally well, and f- metaphorically. Most of the people that are cutting a trailer, that's the marketing department. That's not the filmmaker, you know? Oh yeah. No. Yeah. That's, you got to, you got to go show the boss like, Look, man, this is gonna make horror fans go see this. Okay, yeah. It, All they care about is that that paper. They yeah. don't care about anything else. Yeah. yeah, it's the same reason why a lot of scenes you see in trailers nowadays, it's even worse than what it used to be. Never make it into the movie because they just grab some dailies and go here, make a trailer, and, and someone not really involved in the production at all goes, "Oh, this shot's cool. Oh, this looks cool." Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's why there's such a phenomenon now of scenes that aren't in the final product, you know, which not to not to go off on a wild tangent here, but I think the trailer for Deadpool 2 had a line in it that completely fell flat in the actual movie. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. just oh man. Well, what are you going to do? Not to make it all about ever you know, the marketing of uh hair edity, but um <laughs> 
Well, no, but I think a film like this, it's important because as we mentioned before, and, and uh, Andrew was, and I were talking about it as well, you know, it's, it's still kind of an indie type of horror film. I know it was wide release and all, but if you look at the way it is, we're getting like one of these now almost every year, one or two, um, where you look at them and, and they at least have, they're trying to either be, or they're, they've got a bit of a not so studio feel to them. Uh, you know, and that's, that's a hard film to market, especially nowadays with the cynicism, as we mentioned, uh, you know, towards indie films, because you would think, oh no, everybody would love them because there's so many more, but at the same time, there's still a huge audience out there that just won't watch it if they didn't have some kind of big name to it. You know, Tony, I know, I know like, man, I swear art house people don't want to go see a horror movie. And the horror people don't want to go see our house movie. A24 is just, despite them, trying to make good movies for an audience that isn't there. <laughs> you know? <Yeah. laughs> and they're just experimenting. They continue to. They they are giving these artists a chance to make these movies despite it. And some of them are going to work better than others. But they're, a classic will come out of it. We won't know that now. We won't know until another 10, 20 years. But one's going to come out of it. I think... The classic of this, you know, this decade of horror, more likely to come out of A24 than, you know, big studio. Oh, yeah. I, I would I would definitely agree on that. Not saying uh, this film is going to be one of the classics. It is interesting. Really, it takes that turn. You're right, Derek, in that third act. Um, I almost wanted to see it just be her crazy because of the way they set her up, where they talk it where after the death of the child, which... I will say that shocking scene came out of nowhere, didn't really feel set up and it didn't feel like it was put in there just to shock you. I mean, that moves that triggers the entire rest of the film. Um, but I would have almost liked it better if she would have just been crazy. Cause you find out how crazy she is, including right Derek trying to set her own kids on fire. That was a cool sequence. Like everything about it, it was building up. I think the moment that the seance garbage happened in this movie, it turned on me. Mm -hmm. Like, that's the moment in the movie where all of a sudden I was like, oh, I know it's going to happen now. Sure. So, but up until that point, yeah, there were some great psychological twists going on. You didn't know it was, was, um, his name's Peter, right? Yeah. Was Peter going to snap? Was the mom going to snap? Was the dad just going to say, fuck it and leave? You didn't know what was going to happen, but everything, everyone was feeling so much. <laughs> you know, there you didn't know where anybody was going to go with anything. I loved that stuff. It was great, and I agree with you. I think if they would have kept it more grounded, at least for my taste, mm -hmm. um, I probably would have really walked away digging this. but. <laughs> Then they bring in the baby horror shit where you got the seance and the moving cup gimmicks and, and all this other like naked people hanging out in corners. And, uh, yeah, just, uh, I, I was digging it. I always enjoyed it just because I'm watching it going, I'm in a big theater and I'm watching a film that's got a whole bunch of naked old people in it and someone just cut their own head off. I'm like, this is awesome. <laughs> well, the funny thing is, <laughs> Literally this week, um, a couple of days before I saw uh, Hereditary, I watched a Turkish film called Baskin. Oh, and I've heard about it. I haven't watched it yet. But... Have you seen this, Andrew? It's on Netflix. Yeah. yeah. Oh, God, like last year, I think. Yeah, and um, there's a lot of similarities, actually, between the two films, because uh, Baskin is, is kind of like a nightmare, a surreal art house nightmare made into a movie. But there's a point in that film where... These people happen upon a cult, and the cult in Baskin is far more outrageous and over the top. But there were these similarities between these two films, where it's just like once it happened in this movie, maybe it was just too. And as it it's of no fault to Hereditary, because I'm sure Baskin wasn't even remotely in the consciousness. Of the <laughs> I'm sure, but there were just like. I kind of felt like I was watching the same thing again. <laughs> so I don't know. Uh, I, I think at this point I'm kind of done with the, the, um, 
the supernatural oogie boogie people in the corner all of a sudden becoming cult aspects of some of this, you know, mass release horror that's coming out. It, um, it's starting to get to the point where it's going from being something that, uh, may have been interesting to begin with to being kind of like a crutch sure. that a lot of these movies are kind of falling upon now. Well, I mean, do you think though that maybe they, the movie maker, at least for this one, he possibly threw that in there because he thought maybe that would help sell the film. I think it's just a horror trope. Yeah. I, I, I mean, it's just, he, he, oh, he, I don't know. I, I couldn't tell you why he would have sure. done that. I just know that, you know, when you're writing a horror film and especially if, you're not, uh, this is really pompous of me to say this, so I don't really want to say that, you know, when you're not confident about maybe pushing yourself beyond the limits, um, you're a fan of what you're a fan of, and maybe that's sure. just what he, he digs. You know, I don't know. I can't explain why why those aspects are in there. It works for some people, and then some people it doesn't work for. I've, I've got a theory about it. I think that, uh, like Jordan Peele, um, you got a lot of people now that are, that are, uh, you know, fans of Rosemary's baby. And sure. that is a film that is respected by art house people and by horror uh, people that know what the fuck they're talking about when they're talking about horror. <laughs> and so that's kind of like their pie in the sky. That is their, of course they're going to like model themselves after that because that is, you know, unlike the exorcist, that is a movie where cause like the exorcist, Everybody like thinks it's it's not it's not a disputed thing that that movie is hor- horrifying, but artistic, you know, there would be debate about that. But pretty much everybody agrees, Criterion Collection, that it uh, that uh, Rosemary's Baby is is one of those high marks with with horror. It's like you know transcendent or whatever. So this guy clearly loves Rosemary's Baby, just like Rob Zombie did it with Lords of Salem, just like Jordan Peele did it with Get Out. You know, and it's going to keep happening because those are the emulated classic, you mm-hmm. know, that's just, there aren't so many of them that people know. Um, would you say like maybe eyes without a face, but that's not a well-known, you know, right. it's not, it didn't have that crossover kind of success. So there aren't very many of them. And so this guy pretty much hit the bullet points of, yeah, don't look now on Rosemary's baby, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd say he, you've got major influences in here on both. Um, and even though I did dig the whole film, yeah, that third act really takes the spin, but we've seen that in other, uh, types of, uh, horror films like this as well. So that's why I was just kind of wondering if you guys think that maybe that was in there because maybe, you know, he thought it it would appeal. Well, if I go this direction, I don't know. Am I going to sell it? Do you, you know, so that's just why I was wondering about that. Uh, Mark, do you, what do you think of the final act? Do you, do you feel that it's, uh, a satisfying um, climax for what had preceded it for what it preceded it. Ah, uh, you know what? I'm not sure. I mean, I dug the film. I love it, but I love outrageous stuff. And like I said before, seeing crazy stuff like that on the big screen. I dig, I was laughing all the way through green Inferno and people were looking at me funny uh, when the cannibal parts started. And I was just, I was like, oh my God, they just did that. That's awesome. So, you know, for me, I wanted, it's like, but within the context of the film, I would say um, it was definitely different. I was kind of hoping they were going to play more towards the her just being crazy and, you know, leaving it kind of, uh, leaving it kind of a uh, question on whether or not you know, some of the stuff that was happening was real or was in her head. I kind of like films like that. So having it it here, though, I did like the gimmick that they were doing with the uh, clicking noise that uh, the girl made. Uh, Charlie, I thought that was a nice little trigger, a little, you know, uh, you know, a signal saying, hey, this is what happened. Uh, Because when that happened in the third act, like when he crashed through the window, uh, I would have almost liked to not see the white spirit go into him, just see him get up and have the little click. Uh, but it did feel like a bit of a different movie. Uh, so overall, in the end, I guess to answer your question in a hugely roundabout way. Um, <laughs> Don't worry, I've been doing it all episode. <laughs> I would say I was happy with it because it was outrageous. I mean, two headless corpses bowing in front of something is is awesome. Uh 
But at the same time, yeah, now that I'm thinking about it more, I think I would have enjoyed it, the ending even more than what I did had they taken the route of just her being crazy and her either offing off the entire family or you make questioning you whether or not, you know, if this was in her head or not, because they played so much and Tony uh, Collette does so well in playing how she's losing her grip, you know, part because of the grief plus her family history and the fact that she kept going back to her miniatures and eventually you get that scene where she smashes them. I'm like, Oh man, okay, we're getting into it now. She's going to be crazy. This is all in her head. Joni doesn't actually exist type of thing. You know, the, the character that she did the sands with, is it actually there? But then they did. And I'm like, Oh, okay. So we took this route. All right. It, it didn't, it didn't turn me off to the film, but I would have liked to see them go more in the direction that it felt like they were setting up for, for that first hour or so of the film. You just don't, it's just not a thing you want to stay with your movie in 2018 that a woman is not to be believed, you know? Yeah, it's, it's just, true. It wouldn't be a good idea. That would have probably like pissed me off to be honest. <laughs> well, no, but I mean, it was just because of the fact that they set up that it was, you know, it ran in her family and either her going crazy or even more having Peter snap finally, you know? So, having, so you were looking maybe more for like a shining level thing. Kind where... of. And, and maybe that's because for me, the shining and I know people will have opinions about it, but the shining for me scared the piss out of me still scares me to this day. Um, a bit. Uh, that that movie scares me. So yeah, I guess I guess uh, maybe a little bit more along the lines of The Shining. For well, me. Tony Collette's like got a great face for horror, you know, and the camera like really loves to push in and, and with her eyes bugging out and her teeth and her face, he she just it, that did remind me of Shelley Duvall in The Shining because that's mm-hmm. a very iconic, um, you know, the way she was shot and um, just the images of her screaming and in distress. Um, Hereditary has that going for it with Tony Collette because she is just wound all the way up all the time mm. and a great actor that can pull that off because it doesn't, it never gets too, too campy. Um, and to the point where, uh, I mean, dude, I don't watch a lot of Italian horror. Am I wrong about this? When she's up there with that garrote wire, just and they have that close up on her face, um, did that seem like Fulci at all to you? Or am I just stupid because I don't know what I'm talking about because I'm too scared to watch his movies. For those. <laughs> I think there's a lot of, or, I mean, it's hard. Or maybe for... house like that, that seventies Japanese movie house. How zoo. Yeah. Yeah. With the flying, flying headless body. I think it's hard now um, for horror movies to not have an Italian horror influence because of the people that are finally making all these movies, you know, mm-hmm. That stuff has become, I remember when we were younger, that was the underground. Yeah. That was the stuff that wasn't necessarily all out there and it was tougher to get. Now all that stuff, thanks to Anchor Bay in the 2000s and, um, you know, re-release, all this stuff has been re-released ad nauseum now. Um, that that stuff is, is just as out there as say, like the movies we're referencing here, The Shining and, Rosemary's Baby and The Exorcist now. So you can see Fulci's uh, House by the Cemetery or um, Argento Suspiria. You can see this stuff, no problem. Yeah. So I I, I, I mean, I could, uh, most horror movies nowadays remind me a lot of, like, have a lot of Argento and Fulci in them. Yeah, I, I had that feel every time he was, and it's not just because it was color, but just a simple fact, every time they had Peter looking out at the uh, the treehouse where his uh, sister was, you know, used to be. And then the mom used, was going up there and how bright red uh, the window was. And then you get the shot where the red is reflected in his eyes. I'm like sitting there going, yeah, OK, this guy watches some Italian horror. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. So I'm not like just a dumb shit. That's okay. no. No, I think if I know everyone's going to sit in point to Tony Collette as being the standout in this movie, but I think Alex Wolf as Peter puts in an astounding performance. Like some of the sequences at post um Charlie dying are just oh, they are well, how do you heartbreaking, play that, man. 
how do you play that? And he's responsible for the death of his sister. You know, I mean, I'm so glad they have that argument. That, oh, that, that scene at about. the dinner table was was awesome. Holy crap! He, that he sorry, turned it around on her. And it's yeah. like you made her, you made me take her. You know, there's, and that God, what a great moment there. There's so many great moments, and I think also this is where, as I had stated before, um, this first like two thirds of this movie plays so strongly because it's confident in allowing its actors to sit and breathe. And there are so many instances where Alex Wolf shots go back to him just brooding or just kind of like in his own head. Yeah. And you're expecting dialogue to happen, but it doesn't. And it makes the emotion so much more impactful. It makes you think about, holy shit, this is really kind of killing him inside right now and there are so many of those sequences where you you expect him to like just completely wildly go off on his mother and he doesn't in the the sequences in which he finally breaks down and he's crying and they he feels like such a real character in contrast to tony collette who's just as andrew said is turned up to 11 yeah like, the good entire contract. movie because so, then she's upsetting him, you know, yeah. with the shit she's doing. It's not normally seen in a horror movie where you have the person like, you got to believe me. Just please give me a chance. I mean, it's it shows how that would really go down if you have grieving people mm-hmm. who are already emotionally like just broken. Right. Um, dealing with someone acting like that. I mean, he cries. He's like a teenage boy and he, he cries, you know. Very he loves little, her. Yeah. He, even yeah. though she's nuts and she's... And they have this fractured relationship because of the whole um, paint thinner incident where she had slept walked and coded Charlie and him and paint thinner and was about to light a match on, which we don't know if that's for real at all. I yeah. took for granted that she was just kind of making something up there because at no point later in the film, maybe I'm wrong and I didn't catch this. Was that really ever brought up again? No, nah, because she like comes to his room and has that big confession about, you know, not wanting him and you know trying to have a miscarriage and all of that stuff, and it's like blowing him up, you know, it's fucking him up. Right. So it's just like I I, I got the, for, I understood that maybe she just like her mother because there's this amazing scene that starts off the movie at a funeral, in which she is standing at a podium kind of reading a eulogy for her mother who had just passed. And usually at these events, it's people trying to um, recollect and reflect on the good things that had happened. And she just rips her mother apart. (laughs) Yeah. In front of this entire, um, you know, funeral. And I got from that scene in a couple other scenes that maybe she has a little bit of a pathological liar streak to her and that you can't quite believe. And that's why toward the end when, you know, Gabriel Byrne turns on her and people are starting to question what her motives are. And is she really seeing what's going on? It's because she doesn't quite seem the most trustworthy character right away. No, no. You're you're right on that. Yeah, she and, and I got that feeling too a little bit. I was wondering because I think you're right that Peter never mentions. I don't think in the film. I may be wrong that actually references her trying to kill them. Mm-hmm. He says he resents her, but I mean that's teen. That could be teenage resentment, right? You're right. I, now that you mention it, now I'm just thinking about it. Yeah, it's just she brings it up, and so it's kind of implied that's kind of why he has this resentment, but he never actually comes out and says, well, you tried to kill us, Mom. Well, I'd and- like to pre- maybe present this to you guys, and maybe you try... Uh, do you think um, there's that scene where after you know her mom dies, she goes to like a uh, like an AA-style meeting for... Um, people who have lost somebody 
and she shows up there and of course um there's they ask for any newcomers to tell their story and let it out and she starts going on this wild tangent about her mom that that honestly felt like she was making it up as she went and that it didn't it didn't even make any sense toward the end of it do you do you think uh, maybe Andrew? Did you feel that maybe that's what she was doing? Just in general, was just kind of like wanting sympathy from everybody all the time. No, never. <laughs> I, I really? believed everything that she said. Yeah, I do. I just I'm kind of conditioned that way. I mean, I've been in those rooms, you know, and and you're like, you know, if someone's like doesn't want to talk, and then all of a sudden they blur it out. There was just so many instances of her like coming clean and blurting things out, you know, you, you get the feeling that that family is used to holding so much sure. inside and never saying anything. And at first they're like, you want to say something and, and for her to like take that opportunity at that funeral to just start seeing that stuff. You're almost like, man, what a, you don't know that what her personality is. So you're just like, I just was sitting there going like, well, what a great way to get out expository dialogue, mm-hmm. you know, with no flashbacks, with no, you know, derailing of the, the structure and, and, and the temperature of each scene from beginning to end, the way that they get, give you your information about her past and about her mother, who the character is dead. You don't ever see anything. You've got just her descriptions to go on. I just thought like the, the, there was so much tension and unspoken things. And then when truths are finally told, you know, everything, everyone clear is upset by it. People don't have outbursts like that <laughs> where they just let go if they haven't been holding things in constantly. Yeah. You do get the impression that now that her mom's dead, the dam has broken. (laughs) Well, it sets Uh, the whole chain off. uh, They go. uh, Yeah. You know, because you get that point in there too, where she's talking about how she didn't want to even have Charlie, but she did because she felt guilt because she held off peter from being with her mom so she had charlie and she drops that one line well then i gave her charlie and then you see pictures where the grandma is always with charlie you're like holy crap yeah and she's like you know she gets her hooks in or whatever she says that and it takes a lot for me to remember things i don't want to have to remember things i don't want to do the work (laughs) you know i'm not a fan of stupid movies but i'm not mr pick up the pieces either you know and you know the fact that we're sitting here after an hour talking about this movie, we remember a lot of shit about it and there's a lot of shit to talk about. So, you know, you know, whether or not it's a a successful as, you know, you know, tonally or structurally or whatever, um, the fact that it makes an impression and it gets people, people will, you know, it's got rewatch value and it's got discussion value. And I think to just dismiss it, I think it would be a real ignorant position. Yeah, I would get, and I think we'll wrap it up here because that's a, that's a good place to wrap it up. I would just say, though, folks, don't sit there and believe the marketing. I saw in my feed, A24 posted a heart monitor of people <laughs> who had watched the film. That's and, a good gimmick. <laughs> and I was like, wow. I'm like, holy crap. I'm like, we're back to the tingler now. <laughs> we're like, are we going to have to start signing, you know, we won't hold the theater responsible if we have a heart attack during this movie? That would be uh, awesome, Mark. That would, would be, be so great. It would well, be I awesome. suggested to Cine uh, when they told me when the, the, the critic screening was going to happen, I said, are y'all setting up the coward's corner? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's awesome. Uh, you know, so I saw that that gimmick, but I and the problem is too the word that phrase "scariest movie movie ever" has been thrown around a lot in the last six months. Was it that movie on Netflix or whatever? I forgot. Veronica, huh? Veronica. Veronica. People are saying the scariest movie ever. You know, I kind of actually avoided it, not because I didn't want to be scared, but I'm just like, yeah, I've heard that told before. You know, and when I heard that with this, and after I watched it, I'm like, you know, I really dug this as a good movie, but I would market it as the scariest movie ever because 
the scares that people you're you, that many of the modern movie horror audience is probably looking for aren't in this film, <laughs> you know, until you get to kind of the end. So <laughs> I, I I'd say as well that it's, it is a memorable one. It is one that we we've talked about. It is one I want to watch again because I know I missed hints and things. And there's other things he did like with the models, like one of the models in the uh, house it, down at the bottom of the stairs we get a shot of it to where it's actually like three houses on top of each other. Mm-hmm. That was um, really cool. And that was really cool. I'm like, where did that come from? I don't remember that. See that, before. you know? So, I mean, there's stuff like that as well, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, it is one that I think people should watch uh, even with the, you know, it, even though it does take that turn in the third act, I, I really dug it quite a bit. Um, and it, it, it is one that, you know, it's it's a different horror film than a lot of your jump scare McQueens that we've been getting lately. Uh, Derek, what about your final thought with Hereditary? I, said you, right? you, <laughs> I didn't know if you just cut off or what just no, happened. I, there, I, my brain cut off. It's like, wait, say, don't stop. No, now you screwed it up. Hereditary. Now you now you done <laughs> fucked up. Like, what do you think? Heard it. Heard it. Heard it. Heard it. E. <laughs> Hurtatory. Um, you know, I I'm glad that I went and saw this movie. I think obviously a lot of the points that Andrew had just made are very valid and very true. I think there is a lot to sort through in this movie, and I did find myself upon leaving the theater. I mean, immediately my knee jerk reaction was, uh. <laughs> But as I walked to the car and I sat and I thought about it, uh, there was a lot that my brain wanted to sit and chew on. And I like that. I like that a lot. Um, what I don't like is the last act of this movie that turns into edgy baby horror. And that unfortunately leaves this to be a movie that more than likely I'm not going to revisit. Sure. Um, Basically because it it builds up to something that is just really unsatisfying to me. So um, I would recommend people go out and support this, obviously, because it's not um, a Halloween movie. It's not, uh, you know, the 500th zombie film that's come out. It's not The Conjuring. It's even though I liked the last Insidious, it's not another Insidious film. Um, go support it. I, I think, you know, there's, even though I might not have liked the last act, there was still a lot to enjoy mm-hmm. in this movie. Agreed. Well, well said, gentlemen. We will wrap it up tonight. Uh, hope you folks go out and support Hereditary. See, I see, I got it right, even though uh, my, my vocabulary is broken. Thank you. Thank you all. So <laughs> now we're just going to take this moment to where these fine gentlemen can shill the hell out of themselves and let you know where you can find them when they're not talking in here with me. Derek, go ahead. I got nothing. Thanks for having <laughs> me on the on the podcast. I no longer run podcasts. So I got nothing. Well, you sound you you actually sound kind of relieved at that. So <laughs> I'm done. I'm out. There is stuff that's archived out there, though. So yeah, that's really if you good want stuff. to, I used to run a podcast called Astro Radio Z. You can go find it. The entire runs on iTunes. Um, other than that, yeah, I uh, maybe in the next year, hopefully, you'll get to see. I edited a little movie called Manos Returns. Um, hopefully, I'm yeah. Support it. Gonna, we're gonna play it in Athens, man. I already got them the hookup for the theater. Right on, right, right on, right on, right on. Love it. So go check that out. Go support it. Go go to Facebook.com and uh, find Manos Returns or Manos Returns. Manos. And uh, go support that little gimmick. It's fun. The, ma- the master will approve. So, uh, <laughs> and Andrew, how about you, sir? Oh, man. Hey, you know what, dude? I got to say this, homie. Um, I don't want to go see any horror movie that's new. I don't. <laughs> I grudge every new horror movie I watch. I watch it grudgingly and I don't care how that makes me sound. Just there's been a wealth of horror in the past that, that I'm really interested in 
seeing that I have missed. And so I have no need to be on the cusp and the pulse of everything new when there's so much old that's waiting for me uh, as an old person. <laughs> and and the movies that we get um, uh, are a reflection of the movies that we are in mass paying for and supporting and going to see. And um, as my dissatisfaction and disinterest in them grows, it, it's clear to me that, you know, that's just that's the way things have kind of shifted. I'm not waiting for a new horror movie to appeal to me. I'm not waiting for them to make something that I like. Uh, if I happen to see a director, you know what I'm saying? That work that I enjoyed, I'll watch their next thing. But you know what I'm saying? It's like that. But um, I don't make horror movies necessarily. My friends and I in Athens, Georgia, we make uh, like crazy feminist cult movies on very low budget. And you can find us at amazon.com slash V slash gonzorific g-o-n-z-o-r-i-f-f-i-c awesome yes check out his stuff if, if anything for the titles of his movies alone <laughs> oh, dude it. yeah man we we made space boobs in space that's another that's a title and um we recently shot a film called vincent price's skull hopefully be out this fall at some point can't Appeal wait into my one. sensibilities <laughs> oh, dude <laughs> The Skulls and Vincent and Price. Price. That's what they're oh, like. It's, well, it's got a bikini car wash. That's how yeah. it starts. See? Well, see? There you go. Appeal into my sensibilities. <laughs> when is this gimmick coming out? And when can I have, have it in my skating. hands? <laughs> it's roller, got roller skating. Holy shit. <laughs> yeah. I'm at, yeah, bikini on roller skate. Yeah. I, wow. well, I'm, I'm editing it now. Awesome. My my Gonzorific collection needs more brothers and sisters. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, we going we going to do what we do, homie. Awesome. Great stuff. Check out all of these fine gentlemen's material out there, folks. Thank you so much for listening to us talk about uh, this interesting film, which I'm not going to say again because I'll probably get the name wrong. So <laughs> thank you so much for listening. I'll say good night, gentlemen. Good night, gentlemen. <laughs> Hey, all my friends out there looking for more spoiler room goodness? Then why don't you check out our brand new Patreon page, patreon.com slash specialmarkproductions, where you can get access to exclusive spoiler room episodes and a whole lot more. You can also find us on Facebook groups at SMPRD and on to Twitter at SpecialMarkPro. Let your voice be heard and let us know what you would like to see in the spoiler room, as well as just how we're doing in general. We appreciate your support, and remember in the spoiler room, the conversation is fresh, but we do spoil the movies.